Let us join our hearts in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A couple of months ago, the bishop called and asked if I would preach at annual conference. We talked for a few minutes, and then at the end of the conversation, I thought to ask, Bishop, which service will I be preaching? He said, the memorial service on Friday night. Well, I hung up the phone. I looked out the window, barely seeing the newly budding trees or the cool blue waters of the sound. I thought, what have I done? Because here's the truth. In the congregation that I've been serving as pastor for the last nine years, we've had 30 deaths a year. That means a memorial service about every two weeks. And I confess, in these last few months, as I've come up to my retirement this weekend, I've sometimes looked out at my congregation on a Sunday morning, these people I've come to love, and thought, I don't want to bury any more of you. I'm tired of death. I don't even want to think about death anymore. It's not that I'm worried about what happens after we die. I know that we belong to God in life and in death. And I trust that the God who created us in the first place can do it again. Whatever comes after this earthly life is bound to be good. It's not the going that I resist. It's the leaving and the being left. A member of my congregation recently gave me a book. It's called Being Mortal. Do you know it? It's a New York Times bestseller written by a surgeon at Harvard Medical School. It's a very frank physician's description of what it's like for us as human beings to come to the end of life. The book is about what does it mean for us to grow old, for our bodies to break down and fail, and especially what it means for us to face the reality, the inevitable truth that we are all mortal. Just about everyone I know who's reading that book, and it seems to be making the rounds, is reacting with a kind of fascinated surprise. We know that we're all mortal, of course, but somehow we manage to keep that awareness at bay. There's an old Jewish saying that everybody knows they're going to die but nobody believes it. <laughs> Most of us are like Woody Allen who says, it's not that I'm afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but is that wise? Because the fact remains, as our psalm for tonight puts it, all flesh is grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. Our days are soon gone, and we fly away. You can't even open the morning paper without having to face the reality of tragic and untimely death in Syria, in Orlando, on our own city streets. 
But even barring that, our natural lifespan is, as the psalmist says, 70 years, or if we're strong, 80. Some of us will live longer than that. But at some point, we will come to the end. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more aware I am that we human beings are located in time. It's like we're on this huge conveyor belt, getting on when we're born, moving along through all the predictable ages and stages of life, and that's if we're lucky, and then dropping off the end and leaving this mortal life behind. Scientist Lewis Thomas, in his book called The Lives of a Cell, puts it matter-of-factly. The obituary page tells us of the news that we are dying away, while the birth announcements off at the side of the page inform us of our replacements. But we get no grasp from this of the enormity of the scale. There are seven billion of us on the earth, and all seven billion of us must be dead on a schedule within this lifetime. That vast mortality involving something over a hundred million of us each year takes place in relative secrecy. It's hard to see how we can continue to keep the secret of death with such multitudes doing the dying. We will have to give up the notion that death is a catastrophe or detestable or avoidable or even strange. As a child once said to me, every hundred years, all new people Death is a natural and integral part of life. It will come to us and to everyone we love. So rather than try to hide that from ourselves, we might do well to look at it. Our psalm for tonight ends with a prayer. Oh God, teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What is this wisdom that comes with knowing that our days are numbered? One day, years ago, I was driving on a freeway in Los Angeles. I was listening to an interview with Rollo May, the famous psychologist, on the car radio. I remember being startled when May said, Immortality is a bad idea. Christians, he explained, don't believe in the immortality of the soul. That's an ancient Greek idea. Even Jesus of Nazareth really, truly died. Death, he said, makes each moment of life more compelling. Without death, the Greek gods on Mount Olympus were bored with their never-ending days and their interminable lives. At that time, what May said made little sense to me. I was young then. I was still immortal. But it comes back to me now. And I turned to his book called Love and Will. In that book, he records a letter written by another famous psychologist, Abraham Maslow. Maslow died at the age of 58. But before that, he survived a very serious heart attack. And while he was recuperating, he wrote this. The confrontation with death and the reprieve from it makes everything so precious so sacred, so beautiful, that I feel more strongly than ever the impulse to love it, to embrace it, and to let myself be overwhelmed by it. My river has never looked so beautiful. Death and its ever-present possibility makes love, passionate love, more possible. 
I wonder if we could love passionately, if ecstasy would be possible at all, if we knew we'd never die. Have you ever been sick, really seriously sick, and then recovered and realized afresh how good it is just to be alive in this world? I have. You start to feel better, and it's like waking up. What an amazing gift it is just to taste the sweetness of a peach. You see the morning sunlight poured over the breakfast table and the curve of a loved one's neck. You look out the window at the garden, at the powerful sky, a cloud passing behind a tree. And you see it. You don't miss seeing it. The reprieve makes everything so precious, so sacred, so beautiful that I feel more strongly than ever the impulse to love it, to embrace it, and to let myself be overwhelmed by it. That's wisdom. The wisdom of the psalmist. But if you're like me, that clarity passes. I don't know, maybe we can only bear it for so long. Because gradually we resume going about our days as if we had all the time in the world to waste in unfulfilling activities, joyless relationships, obsessive plans and worries about the future, we can careen from one day to the next, to the next, to the next, crossing off lists, getting things done, allowing ourselves to be absorbed by or upset by things that don't matter very much. And if we took time to think about it, aren't really what we want our lives to be about. Death has a way of defining the boundaries of our lives, like a frame around a picture, forcing us to focus. It pushes us to ask these big questions, like, what is my life for? What ultimately matters? What will have mattered to me and to God when my life comes to the end? And how, therefore, do I want to spend my limited time and energy now? And who do I want to spend it with? Oh, God, teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible does not mean the endless accumulation of knowledge. Wisdom means knowing what to do with it in order to live as God would have us live. Wisdom asks with the poet Mary Oliver, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? California writer Anne Lamott tells about how she began to learn wisdom. In her book, Bird by Bird, she writes about when her best friend was dying of cancer. Lamott became depressed and angry and sad. She sought out advice from her friend's physician, who happened to also be her personal friend. He said to her, Watch her very carefully right now, because she is teaching you how to live. Lamont writes, I remind myself of this when I cannot get any work done, to live as if I'm dying, 
Because the truth is, we are all terminal on this bus. To live as if we are dying gives us a chance to experience some real presence. Time is so full for people who are dying in a conscious way. Full in a way that life is for children. They spend big, round hours. So, instead of staring miserably at the computer screen, trying to will my way into having a breakthrough, I say to myself, okay, hmm, let's see. Dying, tomorrow. What should I do today? Awareness of mortality not only pushes us to live more intentionally, it also whispers insistently. Life is short. So maybe life is too short to live it the way you're living right now. Or maybe there's something you need to change. Or someone you need to forgive. Or some work you ought to begin because this is the only earthly life you will ever have. And it isn't gonna last forever. U.S. News and World Report tells how average Americans spend their time. According to surveys, if you live to be 70 years old, you will spend 20 years sleeping, 20 years working, and five years showering and getting ready for the day. Time spent standing in line, five years. Time spent doing housework, four years. Time spent in front of a TV or computer screen, nine and a half years. Time spent searching for misplaced objects, <laughs> one year. Time spent opening junk mail, eight months. Time spent sitting at stoplights, six months. More, of course, if you live in Seattle. <laughs> the wisdom of the psalmist is receiving time as a gift and using it intentionally, responsibly, lovingly. I wonder, how much time will we have spent savoring the present moment? Or praying? Or speaking what we know is true? Or looking across that sunlit breakfast table at the one we love and leaning forward on our elbows ready to listen. The title of this sermon comes from a line by, of all people, Don Juan. He said, keep death on your shoulder. It will remind you to love. I think of the friends and colleagues that we're remembering tonight. Ed Hirsch, how much he loved the mountains and a good cigar. Evelyn Knudsen, whose loves ranged from lunar exploration to local church ministry. Bill Kate, whose consuming passion in life was social justice. I hear them asking us, what and who do you love? The people you love will not always be with you. Enjoy them now. Your parents, your friends, your children, they may not know how much you love them. Maybe you've never told them in words. Tell them. Even though we know we are growing old, we will never be young again. We are dying. Even though our days are slipping away, perhaps because they're slipping away, life 
is unspeakably sweet. But we're still right here, now, today, while we are here. Let us live and love well. Tonight we are surrounded by a whole cloud of witnesses whispering their wisdom. Teach us to number our days. My river has never looked so beautiful. Let's see, dying tomorrow. What should I do today? Keep death on your shoulder. It will remind you to love. Let us listen to these voices. Let us honor their wisdom. Let us live with reverence, courage, joy, passion, and deep gratefulness for the gift of every single day we have upon this earth. Amen.